Welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome to the 2023 Marston Lecture by Dr. Dawn Wright, The Dive of a Lifetime to the Deepest Place on Earth. I'm Julia Jones, and I'm the director of the program in Geography and Geospatial Science. And it's a great pleasure to have Dawn here this evening. Uh, first, I'd like to start <clears throat> with a land acknowledgement and acknowledge that Oregon State University is located on the traditional lands of the Mary's River or Ampanefu Band of the Kalapuya, who lived here for millennia. They were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon, and their living descendants are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. <clears throat> in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences, we are working to broaden understanding of how indigenous peoples and their living descendants live in relation with the earth, the ocean, and the atmosphere. We are committed to work toward honoring tribal sovereignty, advancing social justice, and helping create a more equitable, brighter future for tribal nations and Native American and, and indigenous faculty and students. Tonight is the Marston Lecture. The Marston Lecture in Geography was established in 2015 by geography alumnus Richard Marston, who received both his master's degree and PhD from our program. The Marston Lecture was created to bring national and international scholars who have made important contributions in the areas of geogra geographic inquiry to OSU. We are fortunate that Dr. Marston is joining us in the audience tonight. Please join me in recognizing his generosity. Uh, so the plan for tonight, Dawn will lecture and then at the conclusion of her lecture, our Dean of the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences, Dr. Tuba Oskan Haller, will join Dawn on the stage for a conversation in these comfy chairs and to answer your questions. So, and now it's really a great pleasure and an honor to introduce Dr. Dawn Wright, the Marston Lecturer. Dawn, whom we all know as Deep Sea Dawn, joined the faculty at Oregon State University in 1995, where she is a professor of geography and oceanography. Dawn is internationally recognized as a primary leader in the field of marine geography, starting with her earliest, starting with her earliest trips to the seafloor in Alvin, continuing through her PhD and throughout her career, Dawn has been a major force leading the development of geospatial science for the oceans. Dawn's publication record includes books, peer-reviewed articles, and magazines for reflecting the broad relevance of marine geography to science and society. Dawn's early research publications laid the groundwork for the emergence of marine geospatial science and greatly influenced the perception of GIS as a science, not just a technology. Her work has focused on mapping the ocean floor, as well as such diverse topics as cyber infrastructure, marine protected areas, and women in GIS. At OSU, Dawn has taught popular courses in GIS and geography of the oceans. And she established the certificate program in geographic information sciences, one of the earliest such programs in the nation. I also learned today that she started GIS Day and today in the 1990s. And today is GIS Day. <laughs> Since joining Esri as the chief scient as their chief scientist in 2011, Dawn has continued to help structure the field of marine geography and geospatial science. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, 
and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And to us, Dawn is a beloved colleague and a generous friend who has shared with us her sweet mother, her dog Lydia, who has been our departmental dog, and her love of Legos. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. Thank you, Dick, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. And thank you, everyone. I see so many friends and colleagues in this audience. This is, I feel like this is my birthday, you know? <laughs> you know, on GIS Day, people across campus would say, happy GIS Day, Dawn, like happy birthday, Dawn. <laughs> so, so this is wonderful. Thank you so very much for coming. I, I really appreciate this. Now I uh, need to do some adjusting here. And it was nice, uh, Julia, just as you were doing the introduction, my screensaver kicked in and gave us a nice view of the big island. <laughs> and I do need to explain the Stanford cap here. <laughs> I am wearing, I did wear a Stanford cap at sea because the leader of our expedition, who you will hear about, Victor Vescovo, is a proud Stanford alum. So I made him very happy by wearing a Stanford cap, but my socks were beaver socks. <laughs> okay, so let's with this and Oops, I don't have my mouse with me, so there we go. I, I'd like to, to start this, though, with a, a very poignant note, because uh, on Sunday, we lost really a giant of a human being, a giant in ocean exploration, in ocean science, uh, in ocean engineering, uh, Don Walsh, he was a <clears throat> courtesy faculty member at OSU as well. He and Jacques Picard were the first two human beings to descend to Challenger Deep in 1960. So many of us are still grieving his loss because not only was he a tremendous uh, explorer, but he was a very giving human being. He, he was like a father to me and I hope I can get through this. Uh, he was so generous. Uh, he gave and gave and gave and gave during the uh, Ocean Gate uh, Titan disaster. He was on uh, webinars, consecutive webinars for several hours. Uh, he, he passed away at the age of 92. So his stamina, his energy, his life force were just absolutely tremendous. I'm wearing a, a pin. Uh, it's a US Navy diver pin uh, that Don Walsh designed it has the Trieste submersible on it, as well as two uh, deep diving dolphins. Uh, and he gave these pins to uh, those of us who descended to Challenger Deep. So it's a wonderful keepsake. He also gave me a Challenger Deep uh, coin. Uh, he gave in so many ways. He was uh, a mentor to so many of us and his memory will be with us forever. We are all richer because of Don Walsh and uh, his memory will be a blessing to me. And I hope that for those of you who do not know about Don Walsh, that you'll uh, go and find out more about him. There, there's a lot about him right now that's on the internet. So this lecture uh, is dedicated also to Don Walsh. So let's start with this. And I am gonna tell you about a special expedition that took place uh, last year. And it was the dive of a lifetime. Now, I, I think we can also see things a little better. Can we lower the lights a little bit uh, so that we can see the images? And there are going to be videos. There are going to be deep sea videos. We want to be able to, to see those. So I'm showing you this picture of this is the good ship pressure drop after the Shirley Temple song. It wasn't named after Shirley Temple, but they, the crew called it the good ship pressure drop one of the happiest ships I've ever been on. 
But I love this picture of the pressure drop and its two support vessels in the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. There's so many people that I talk to, so many audiences that are still unaware of the wonder and the importance of the ocean. Now, I think I'm preaching to the choir here in Corvallis <laughs> and at Oregon State, especially with our fantastic college of earth, ocean, and atmospheric sciences. But th there's, there's something about being able to understand the ocean from the top to the bottom. There is so much that we hear about the surface of the ocean. And this is a really, truly compelling visualization. Probably a lot of my colleagues have used this uh, in class uh, that shows the, the current regime, the currents that are circulating at the surface. And we know now that the ocean uh, uh, circulates heat and salt and carbon and nutrients. I think people are starting to come around to this and how the ocean is the engine of our daily weather and of our long-term climate. But the next step is for us to help the public and policymakers and everyone to understand how this is the surface, but there's so much beneath the surface. And we have this dynamism that extends all the way to the ocean floor. And that's one of the reasons why we dive. Uh, that's one of the, that's the, the, there's so many of my colleagues who are oceanographers uh, in this audience. Uh, they can, they can tell you how important this is. So this is the Hadal Exploration System uh, that we used last year. It's called a Hadal Exploration System. And thank you, uh, because the Hadal zone is the deepest zone that you can get to uh, in, in the world, in the ocean. And it is named after Hades. Uh, for, for us, it's, it's hell, but it is a ecology, it is a life force for the creatures that live there. And there, are, there is an ecology, a biodiversity down there at the deepest parts of the ocean. Now, in order to study that particular zone of the ocean, of course you need a research vessel. This is the pressure drop but the, the star of the show is the limiting factor. This is the only submersible in existence right now that can make repeated trips to the deepest parts of the ocean. There is a Chinese submersible, the Fendoja, which has been to Challenger Deep. It made one descent, but limiting factor uh, has made dozens uh, of descents. And Victor Biscovo has taken it 15 times to Challenger Deep. I believe James Cameron submersible made one trip. There is the situation with the Ocean Gate Titan submersible. We know what happened there, how it imploded. This is a matter of the most advanced engineering. And it's a special type of vehicle that can withstand the, crush, the, the crushing depths of the deepest parts of the ocean, below 4,000 meters where Titan imploded, below 6,000 meters, 6,500 meters, which is the maximum depth that the Alvin submersible can go now, all the way down to uh, 10,900 plus meters, which is where we descend. Now, another thing that's very important is to have robots to accompany you uh, when you go to these deepest places. And I just have to stop and say that I am absolutely in love with these little white food delivery robots. <laughs> I, love, I don't know when this started at OSU, but coming back now and seeing them going their, their nice little quiet way all through campus and stopping for you, stopping at crosswalks. I just love them. <laughs> anyway, we had robots to accompany us to Challenger Deep as well. And so these are the, the landers. They're called... Uh, landers because they they land autonomously on the seafloor and they provide navigational support they provide they, they are sampling devices uh, they can give us another vertical profile of the water column in terms of the, the the critical properties of temperature and salinity especially and they take fantastic videography as you'll see there are also a couple of support vessels that help with the navigation uh, with tracking the submersible and the landers. And uh, they are actually on board right now uh, or in this particular picture in the upper left. 
But anyway, this is the system. This is the submersible. It has two names. Actually, it has three names now because this whole system has been sold uh, to Inkfish Expeditions, but that's another, that's another lecture. Uh, at the time that I was involved with this organization, uh, the limiting factor uh, is the name uh, of Victor and the crew. That's what they call this, this vehicle. But it was built by Triton Submarines in Florida. So it has the official name of the Triton 3600-2 because of its maximum depth. And it is built for two people. It uh, has a 16-hour uh, endurance uh, level. Uh, 96 hours of emergency life support. So that's very critical as well. You have 96 hours to solve your problem. Uh, and then and then it's then it's over. Uh, but this is the most amazing vehicle for those uh, in the audience who have worked with uh, ROVs or have built ROVs or have uh, been in Alvin or other submersibles, you know what a marvel of engineering uh, this is. There's a story about how the limiting factor was built, which is a wonderful, uh, it's about a 30 minute video on YouTube. Just search for uh, the limiting factor and you'll find the film. It really is a fantastic story. And it involves uh, going to Russia actually, <laughs> because this is, the, this is the personnel sphere. This is what we're actually sitting inside of. So you can see the difference here, this is the complete submersible, and think about uh, the circular spherical part there, and then this is what it's covering. So this is the crux of safety uh, at the deepest parts of the ocean. First of all, a spherical shape, not a cigar shape. Again, thinking about the Titan, and certainly not carbon fiber. This is made out of titanium and it was machined to 99.9% .9 perfect sphericity because that's the geometry that can withstand the greatest pressures uh, that the earth can supply. In fact, the, the, the pressure uh, that we were under, not finals week, but or not proposals, but uh, hydrostatic pressure, <laughs> 16,000 pounds per square inch or 1100 atmospheres. Now, the interesting thing about this, and by the way, this is Riley. This is the successor to Lydia. <laughs> we had a wonderful opportunity to see this submersible broken apart in bits because luckily there was a major refit of the submersible before I had my dive. And so I had an opportunity that most divers never get, which is to see all the bits and pieces of the submersible and the technical staff showed me everything and we got to, to see the personnel sphere in this state and to see how things were being uh, refitted, parts were being uh, replaced. The highest safety standards, of course, were part of this. This submersible is certified. That's another difference with Ocean Gate and Titan. There's a lot of time, a lot of money uh, to, to certify these vehicles uh, for safety. And the interesting thing about a perfect sphere, okay, you've got a sphere to withstand hydrostatic pressure, but then you poke three holes in it. And in this case, you cut it in half and you bind it together with these straps. How in the world is that going to be safe? Well, the interesting thing about hydrostatic pressure with this type of design is that the deeper we went, the safer I felt. Now, there, there are many scientists who have gone down in the limiting factor with Victor Vescovo, and I'll explain all of that about Victor in a minute. But Victor also took other people who were not scientists, they were not experienced with doing deep sea science. Uh, they were adventurers or explorers. And one thing about the limiting factor is that as you descend, a little bit of water gets into the submersible. And then there's also condensation on the inside because of your, your breathing. So water is getting in a little bit, but the deeper you go with that, with that pressure, everything is sealing. So the seal uh, at, at each of the viewports and the seal in the middle of the, of the diving bell and at the hatch, that is perfectly sealed at full ocean depth. 
at 10,900 plus meters. So it was, it was wonderful. The deeper we, we went, uh, there was no panic for me. I was like, yes, this is gonna be great. Now we're really safe. <laughs> and I don't wanna come back. <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> Another thing about uh, this expedition, and again, for so many of us who go to sea, this is a wonderful United Nations of uh, researchers and technical staff, uh, the crew. In our case, we had 14, I think there are 14 flags here. We had 43 people on board, seven of us were women. Uh, and it was just a wonderful way to, uh, again, communicate and have camaraderie and get to know uh, people from all of these different countries. I had never met anyone from Albania before, but uh, we had an Albanian scientist. In fact, the nation of Albania is one of the partners in building the limiting factor. Uh, it really has quite a, fas a fascinating story. Now, why was the limiting factor built? Why, why go through all of this? Because this is not an NSF, this is not a UNO ship. It is not an NSF funded type of arrangement. This is a private, uh, a private operation. This is not unlike uh, Jeff Bezos with uh, Blue Origin or Elon Musk with SpaceX or uh, Wendy and, and Eric Schmidt with the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Uh, th these, are, these are different types of arrangements. In this case, this was built and put together by one man, Victor Biscovo, who is a, a tremendous uh, explorer. He's a private equity investor and out of his personal wealth, he wanted to do something really special to study and to explore the ocean. And he found out that the five deepest parts of the ocean had not been visited and further had not been bathymetrically mapped at high resolution. He started this uh, expedition, it's called the Five Deeps Expeditions or the Five Deeps Expedition. 2018 was when they started. 2018, and we still had not had true bathymetric, accurate, rigorous mapping of these deepest parts of our planet. And we're still with the Seabed 2030 initiative, we are still only 24.9% of the way there in terms of mapping the entirety of the ocean floor at what we call modern mapping standards, or certainly at the same level of detail as we have the US interstate highway system mapped, or I'll say it again, maps of Mars or Venus or the moon, we have the more accurate maps of those uh, heavenly bodies than of our own planet. Now the five deeps uh, that Victor uh, explored over the course of 2018, <clears throat> excuse me, it's been a long GIS day. <laughs> Over the course of 2018 uh, to 19, he and his, his intrepid crew, they went to the Malloy Hole, that is the deepest point in the Arctic Ocean, uh, to the Java Trench in the Indian Ocean, to the South Sandwich Trench in the Southern Ocean, the Puerto Rico Trench, which is the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean, and this is also where Alvin did its 6,500 meter uh, depth certification for its uh, revised uh, sub, refurbished sub. And then of course there is Challenger Deep. I'm also showing this map, a very special map to you with Antarctica in the center of the world. Now, for those of you who are polar scientists, you're like, yes, finally. Um, this is a special uh, projected coordinate system that was devised by Athelton, uh, Athelston uh, Spielhaus uh, many, many decades ago. And he envisioned this rendition of the ocean, which is really, I think, the way that we should think about it. One interconnected system, uh, one ocean, one ocean, one planet, one people. Uh, this idea of one is really powerful now, especially for those of us who are involved in the United Nations the United Nations Ocean Decade, uh, oh, the United Nations uh, Decade of Science for Sustainable Development. We often shorten that to the Ocean Decade. So the United Nations is using this view uh, of, the, of the world uh, to get across to all of us how important the ocean is. 
So this is what we call the, the Spielhaus uh, projection. You can get this on a t-shirt, of course. And uh, of course the projected geometry, uh, the team, the projected geometry team at uh, Esri did the mathematics, Matt. They did the mathematics necessary in order to put this into ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro for our GIS fans out there. Now, Victor, he is, uh, I'll say a little bit about him because he's a very, very important uh, person in, in my view. He is a great lover of the sea, uh, having been a former commander in the US Navy. Uh, he's a passionate explorer. He is a map geek. Now he has summited the highest peaks on all seven of the world's continents, including Mount Everest, he has skied at least 100 kilometers to both the North and the South Poles. With the completion of the Five Deeps expedition in August 2019, he also became the first person in history to have been to the top of all the world's continents, to reach both poles, and to descend to the bottom of all of the uh, oceans, the Five Deeps. And as if that wasn't enough, in June 2022, right before taking me to Challenger Deep, he flew 100 kilometers into space on Blue Origin's New Shepard 21 mission, and thus became the first person to climb Mount Everest, to dive to Challenger Deep, and to go to space. Now, he told me that he was doing this fly. I said, Victor, you're supposed to take me to Challenger Deep. You're going to go into space one month before our expedition. He said, oh, don't worry. We'll, we'll be up there for a few minutes, and we'll come back down, and uh, I'll see you in port. <laughs> And, and that's what happened. <laughs> now, after the five deeps, uh, after he completed the five deeps, his intention was to sell this Hado exploration system and move on because uh, he doesn't have infinite resources. And uh, he was looking for a way to, to move into more adventure and to do something else. But he, he was trying to find a buyer uh, for for the whole system, for the ship, the submersible, uh, everything. And until he could do that, he kept on exploring. So he would return to several of these places. And certainly he returned quite a bit to Challenger Deep. And I think I mentioned that he has now made 15 descents to Challenger Deep. And in the second phase of his, his explorations, he started to fill that second seat uh, in the submersible because he did the five deeps by himself uh, to set those records. And I think there, there are three types of, of people that he filled that second seat with. There were the pleasure explorers, the people who could afford to pay $750,000 to accompany him to Challenger Deep. And that helped him to uh, continue to finance the Caladan Oceanic uh, operation, the, the whole organization. So that was the way that they kept uh, everything uh, funded and going. He also decided to take a uh, special guests or you know, people who could, he wanted to honor in some way uh, to inspire people, people to set additional records uh, aside from just him. And this is how I, I think uh, I was brought into the, the orbit here because uh, in 2020, he took Kathy Sullivan down. And Kathy Sullivan is to many of us She's the former administrator of NOAA, but many of us also know her as the first American woman to walk in space. So he wanted Kathy to be the first woman to dive to Challenger Deep. And so uh, in March, 2020, he took her to Challenger Deep. Kathy Sullivan is also a good friend of Esri and she asked Victor to ask us at Esri to do the mapping for that expedition. Because since he had finished the five deeps, uh, he did, he lost his mapper. He lost Cassie Bongiovanni, who did the bathymetric mapping uh, during the five deeps expeditions. And there is a book that's called The Deepest Map that tells her story. That is really quite a story of what she accomplished uh, as a bathymetric mapper, as a woman uh, during that two years of crazy, crazy adventure. But that's a, that again, that's another another seminar. So at any rate, uh, Victor came to us at Esri and came to my boss and, and said, can you send someone out to, to do the mapping? And can you send Dawn Wright to do this? 
And I very much wanted to go, but it was March, 2020. And we all know about March, 2020, the whole world shut down. We at Esri were on lockdown. They were already in Guam. So they were gonna do their expedition. They were gonna do the dives, but we just could not send anyone uh, to help. They did eventually get someone to, to go out and do the mapping with them. But that started the relationship uh, between uh, Victor and Esri uh, and, and me. And that's how I got the invitation a couple years later to, to accompany Victor to Challenger Deep last year. At any rate, you see Kathy is wearing a special patch on the left there. It's a patch that she designed herself. Uh, the patch says that she is the most vertical person in the universe. <laughs> and she is because no one has soared higher, walked in space, and then uh, been deeper than Kathy Sullivan. We also did a series of, for, for the GIS folks in the audience, we at Esri, we did, we did do a series of story maps about her dive and about uh, Victor and about the whole Caladan Oceanic operation and the whole Five Deeps expedition. So uh, that was a wonderful thing that we were able to do just from our cubicles and our offices uh, while they were doing uh, the summer after they, they completed that. Uh, the, the third type of person, the people that Victor took down were, were scientists who uh, he, he handpicked to uh, set records, but to do small experiments with the submersible. Uh, an example is Nicole Yamase. She is a Micronesian. Uh, she's a marine biologist who just got her PhD from the University of Hawaii. And Victor took her down as the first uh, eight Pacific Islander uh, to dive to Challenger Deep, which is really appropriate given that Challenger Deep is technically within the territorial waters of the Federated States of Micronesia. Uh, he took down YT uh, Lin. Some of you may know YT. He's uh, an ocean acoustics expert. Uh, he was at Woods Hole. He's, he's coming to, to Scripps very soon. And uh, YT was the first person of Asian descent to go to Challenger Deep. Victor wanted me to go as the first uh, African a person of African descent to Challenger, Challenger Deep, but we also uh, had a special experiment to perform. YT tested some ocean acoustics equipment and I tested with Victor uh, a, a portable side scan sonar, which I'll talk about. So those were the three types of, of people. This is a map that you're used to seeing <laughs> uh, and, and it shows you again, the uh, location of Challenger Deep within the Mariana Trench in the Western Pacific. This is another special map uh, that we at Esri call a diorama or a fishbowl type of map. It was designed by one of our star cartographers, John Kimmerling. We have a star cartographer uh, who didn't go to OSU and take your classes and somehow he still came out with the, the skill <laughs> in order to do wonders like this. He's from Michigan. <laughs> Anyway, he designed this so you can see Challenger Deep. Uh, you can also see that there are three depressions within Challenger Deep, the Eastern, Central, and Western pools. The Eastern pools where most of the dives have been made because that is the deepest part uh, of, of the depression. Uh, so that's where records are, are set. But very few dives have been made to the Central pool and even fewer to the Western pool. So Victor and I decided to go to the Western pool to do our test. We didn't need to do a depth record. Uh, Victor already set the depth record in the Eastern pool of 10,935 meters. That is how deep the ocean is, 10,935 meters. Uh, Victor and I went to 10,919 meters, <laughs> which is fine with me. <laughs> Just a little bit about life on board. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with research vessels. This is what a bunk uh, looks like. And I always sail with uh, Snoopy. So my um, Santa Barbara friends also know about that. Snoopy goes to sea. Uh, and this is the uh, the picture that you, you've seen quite a bit. I've already explained the Stanford cap. <laughs> uh, I was being uh, trained the day before the dive in terms of how to get, how to properly get into and out of the limiting factor because you wanna be very careful as you climb into the submersible, you don't wanna kick anything or break anything with your feet. Uh, you, there was a, a, little, a little ballet that I had to learn uh, in order to, to do that uh, successfully. 
And uh, I was also wearing this, this shirt that we had a CBS film crew uh, who they were with us the entire time at sea. And then they did a couple of segments for CBS this morning and CBS Saturday morning. And they kept uh, complimenting me and my shirt. And I thought, well, I'm glad I wore this shirt. The shirt says science because making stuff up is not okay. <laughs> <laughs> so here uh, I am actually doing the dive uh, the following day and getting into lim the limiting factor uh, is actually not without a little bit of peril because they they have it extended uh, behind the research vessel. It's not like Alvin where the submersible is on the deck, you climb in and then they lift Alvin off of the deck, swing it out over the water and then into the water. With the limiting factor, it's already extended out over the water. So you've got to climb out there keep your balance and then climb into the submersible. So I was getting a helping hand here and uh, waving goodbye <laughs> and uh, doing what I had practiced in terms of getting into the submersible. Now this is the part that's fun. Uh, how many of you have heard about styrofoam cups at sea? So, so this is a very knowledgeable audience about this. So we were we were the same. We had uh, the styrofoam cups in the mesh bag here that was placed just above uh, the hatch to our personnel sphere so that those cups were subject to the full hydrostatic pressure at Challenger Deep. And true to form, uh, so we, we had cups that were about this size. And when they came back from Challenger Deep, uh, they were shrunk to this. <laughs> this is pretty pretty standard. And I still maintain that these make terrific Christmas gifts. <laughs> we were very busy making our cups because we knew we were going to use them for, for so many gifts. But the kids just love that, you know, that the kids never get tired of seeing shrunken cups. In fact, when I was a, when I was a graduate student at UCSB, we used uh, styrofoam mannequin heads. <laughs> so we had shrunken heads. <laughs> But you know, styrofoam has gone out of style now, so it's very hard to get things in styrofoam. At, at any rate, I want to say also that the styrofoam cups that we used were the recycling uh, category five, so you can recycle them. <laughs> now, of course, I, I'm from Esri, so there's a story map. <laughs> there's a story map that takes you through the dive uh, from, from the start to the finish. It was a 10 and a half hour dive, uh, and this was done by our a uh, wonderful story maps team, the same team that did the story maps for Victor Biscovo after the five deeps. So you can go to this URL and you can uh, get the, the, the whole story map. Uh, this is showing you what our launch was like. And here the submersible is uh, taking on ballast, uh, doing its quiet descent. And we had GoPro cameras inside of the submersible to record uh, everything. And we're on our way. Uh, in the story map, you can also get a 3D web map that uh, actually takes you uh, through uh, sort of like a video game. So if you go to this URL, and this URL will show up in a lot of slides. And if you like to take a picture, the photographs are, are fine. So we made a 3D procedural model of the research vessel and the submersible. And uh, sh it shows it going down to the different depths. 931 meters is when we first saw bioluminescence in the water column. So we saw uh, bioluminescent jellyfish and siphonophores. And uh, as, as with other submersible dives, th this is one of the most amazing parts of a dive for me, especially as someone who is not a biologist. I'm a geologist by training. Uh, Victor actually started flashing the lights of the submersible uh, at this depth, and uh, the creatures flashed back. So it was so cool, <laughs> really cool. We didn't have a way to record that because we didn't have enough battery power to record until we got to the bottom. So you'll have to take our word for it. <laughs> uh, here we are close to maximum depth. Again, the maximum depth of our dive was 10,919 plus or minus uh, six meters. And the total duration was 10 and a half hours because it took us uh, four hours to get down 
two and a half hours to uh, do our survey and our observation and three hours to come back up. Now, this is the picture that went viral uh, while we were at sea. Uh, we were able to tweet out this picture as soon as we got to the bottom, as soon as we got to the bottom, we came upon this infamous beer bottle. We could not believe it. I'm, I'm speechless every time I talk about it. And you can see the label is still on it. We got so many questions about what kind of beer bottle was it? <laughs> was it a Heineken? Was it a Bex? There was this discussion going on on Twitter, these arguments. Finally, the, the, the world decided it was Bex. <laughs> to me, it did not matter. What mattered was that someone had thrown a, a bottle overboard and it reached a place that no human being had been before we had a chance to get there. It's just another indication of what we are doing to the planet, how we, our activities are affecting every part of this planet, including Challenger Deep. So it was uh, very discouraging for us to, to see this right off the bat. But luckily that was just within the first few minutes of the dive. The rest of the dive was what was uh, really exciting and compelling, uh, especially for me, because we saw these vast uh, talus piles of these angular blocky uh, basalt. Uh, and we think they were serpentinized peridotite boulders, uh, certainly indicative of uh, tectonic uh, erosion right there at the axis of, of the trench. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of this was, was sedimented because of the faults and the canyons that were uh, transporting sediment uh, into, into the Western pool. And in terms of life, this is the life form uh, that we saw throughout our dive, these tubed anemones. Uh, and I've learned to pronounce the name, the genus name is Galaanthium, uh, uh, Galaanthemum, <laughs> still practicing, so I'm not a biologist. <laughs> uh, Alan Jameson of the University of Western Australia is the, the expert uh, in terms of uh, hadal biology in Challenger Deep. So I learned how to say it from, from him. But this is at 10,630 meters depth, but we saw these creatures at, at all depths. And here is a, a video. There's a, there's a little tubed anemone, but this is what it looked like. This is from our forward cam. Uh, again, a lot of sediment had uh, come into to the area, uh, transported from, from the top of the, of the trench. And uh, just uh, an alien, uh, it seemed like a very cruel, uh, very, of course, it's an extreme world, but uh, and a little scary as well. But it took me about 20 minutes because my diving experience is on uh, mid-ocean ridges. And so that's a completely different uh, environment, zero age basalt, uh, the hydrothermal vents and all of the beloved creatures like the tube worms and such. So, so this was a, a different experience, but when we got to the point where we wanted to, where we needed to leave, I didn't want to leave. Uh, it was just, just fantastic. This was really like a, a moon, a moon landing, uh, and a moon exploration. And this is a rough uh, track of the dive. So we we came down and landed uh, in the middle of the western pool of Challenger Deep, and then we pretty immediately headed for for the wall because. Along the southern wall of the Western Pool is where we wanted to test our sonar instrument. So we did a few uh, transects back and forth. They, those transects are not reflected in this particular track. This is just showing you an overall idea of what we did. And our uh, instrument was this little instrument, uh, side scan sonar, two transducers, uh, they were affixed to the bottom of the submersible uh, at my end. I was sitting on the starboard side of the submersible. Victor was at the port side. And, and the idea was to see if, the, if this instrument could function uh, at full ocean depth. Normally, these portable systems, which are used mainly for finding shipwrecks or finding uh, large objects on the seafloor. In fact, the cousin of this vehicle had been used earlier in the year to help find Shackleton's endurance. So this is uh, this vehicle was made by, uh, the, the uh, instrument was made by Deep Ocean Search of France and Mauritius. 
and they, they made the sonar that found Shackleton's endurance. Uh, and then uh, again, a, about a month or so before our expedition, they used uh, this sonar to find the deepest shipwreck ever found, which is the Samuel B. Roberts. They found that around 6,895 meters. So it was looking good that this instrument could uh, survive the pressures of Challenger Deep and give us data. Uh, and so that's what we wanted to do. This is a picture of the underside of the submersible as we were being, as it was being lifted up and hoisted uh, on the rear, uh, over the rear end uh, of the ship. And this is the type of imagery that this type of instrument brings back. So this is a, what we're looking at here is backscatter, uh, not necessarily the travel time of an acoustic pulse from the instrument to the seafloor and back. That gives you depth, but you can also measure the intensity uh, that that sound pulse comes back. And that intensity is turned into a, a, a white area or a grayscale uh, intensity uh, on a graph like this. This is actually uh, the Samuel B. Roberts uh, that was found with uh, the Mesotech sonar uh, at the front of the submersible. And the instrument that we used gave us similar uh, data. So here I am. Uh, operating the sonar. Uh, there's Snoopy <laughs> uh, operating the sonar and the thumbs up because the sonar turned on. Uh, it was giving us live data. It was functioning uh, properly. So that was our mission accomplished because the idea uh, for us was to see if this worked and then get back with deep ocean search so that they could extend, they could evolve the uh, engineering of this sonar uh, to make it on a more production scale so that we do have this type of instrumentation for the deepest parts of the planet anywhere to find shipwrecks or to do seafloor geomorphological uh, micro, micro studies. Now, I mentioned before that we also had these uh, landers uh, to accompany us. And let's see if this will. So uh, a lander uh, is uh, a robot that has uh, all kinds of additional instrumentation on it. It also has that arm that's extending out from it uh, that's baited with jack mackerel. Uh, so that's the bait to bring the creatures around so that the creatures will crawl into uh, the traps that are at the bottom uh, of the lander and also so that they can be videoed. They will come uh, within the frame of video uh, frame of view of the, of the video and the lights there. And there are also some additional uh, instruments uh, CTD, uh, there is a, a little uh, navigation system so that the first thing that, that we do before a dive is to send down the lander and get the latitude, longitude, and depth of the lander. Once the lander is there, then the submersible can ping off the lander and we get our relative position. And Victor basically dead reckoned from uh, point to point based on uh, us finding the lander when we got down into Challenger Deep. Now, this is a 3D uh, map that shows you, uh, gives you a nice idea of what it was like in Challenger Deep, in the Western Pool. You see CLOSP 3 and CLOSP 4. Uh, CLOSP was the lander that was in with the Western Pool with us. Flare uh, was the lander that we deliberately put at around 7,396 meters because we wanted to get footage of fish. Now, again, I'm not a biologist, but uh, I, I do have, I have learned that fish in the ocean have not been found uh, deeper than 8,000 uh, meters, 8,000 or 9,000 meters. So you're not gonna see fish uh, in Challenger Deep. Uh, they have not evolved to the point where, where they can withstand uh, those, those pressures. But the fish that, are, that we saw from Flare are, are pretty, pretty cool. Let me see if I can get this video to work. So this is at 7,396 meters. These are the snailfish. Pay attention to this little amphipod here. Whoa, <laughs> that poor little guy um, <laughs> came right into the, into the camera. Um, there's also a decapod that's, come, that's taking lunch away uh, and he's gonna make a right turn and head on off with his, with his prize because they're feeding on, on the mackerel that are uh, at the end of this arm that's coming out of the lander. And so we're getting this beautiful camera footage 
The snailfish here are uh, amazing uh, because if you look at them long enough, you can actually see uh, their liver and their heart and other things through their translucent skin. And they, they do have, uh, they produce some type of, of, uh, of enzyme or uh, again, I'm not doing this justice as a geologist, but this is how they're able to withstand the pressures even at 7,396 meters. And they're quite large. They're, they're about a, a 12 inches long. So that gives you a little scale. And here comes the little guy again towards the, oh, he, he's already hit his head again. We couldn't believe that footage. In fact, we wondered that this is what, this is what he looks like uh, at the front. Uh, I don't know how these uh, creatures, this is a giant uh, amphipod, Eurythines is the uh, genus name. And they, they have the, the, the structure that we think are eyes uh, and a nose, but the, this is still very, very new science in terms of how these uh, animals have evolved, how they, they uh, function, uh, how they, they mate, uh, uh, just what their, what their ecology is. Uh, but they are quite remarkable. Now this is, a, the, the kids at GIS day last year got scared by this picture. <laughs> And I told them, well, these, these guys are only a, a couple of inches long. They're not that big. This is just a close up so that you can see uh, what he looks like from the front and, and what he was hitting when he hit his head on the camera, poor thing. More snailfish here, you can see this one feeding, but the Benthicissimus crenatus, uh, the big red prawn uh, is really the star of this show, I think, because he's gonna come close to the camera and look at his antennae, wow. They are, they're just so, so beautiful. So again, we're basically seeing him, uh, the, the red and why he's bright red, I, I do not know. Uh, the other creatures are translucent or white, which makes sense. The, uh, the snailfish, the decapods, the giant, or they're not giant, but the, the big amphipods, those were the main creatures that we saw at that, at that depth. And again, this is from the flare landers. This is not from the submersible. And finally, we were treated to this jellyfish. Let's see if I can get it to. My, uh, my laptop has been temperamental today. It's it's a little tired. So this was identified by a scientist at Monterey Bay Aquarium Institute as Pectus profundicola. Uh, it looks like a little spaceship. Uh, and this, we have since learned that this is the deepest sighting of Pectus profundicola on this, this dive uh, at that depth, along with the other uh, creatures there. So the, the decapods, Pseudoloparis swyri is the scientific name for the snailfish, uh, the Eurythines uh, amphipods, and our uh, alien spacecraft, the Pectus profundicola. So I could show you videos all night long, but uh, I see that uh, I'm, I'm still pretty good on time. Okay, so this is coming back up. I did want to take you through the recovery uh, of the sub, especially for, for those of you who are again, unfamiliar with, uh, with these operations. I thought the recovery of the sub was, was quite fascinating uh, once this footage was shared uh, because this is a GoPro uh, footage from uh, the swimmer's uh, helmet. So this is his, uh, from his uh, viewpoint, Viewpoint, viewpoint uh, on uh, his head. So let me see if I can get this out of the way here. We have uh, finished our dive and we are almost at the surface. So uh, this is the Zodiac that is charged with uh, coming up to us as we surface. And then uh, what they're gonna do is radio uh, the pressure drop, the ship off in the uh, distance so that the ship has uh, these coordinates and can come and get us. So they're just looking around right now 
uh, for our little orange flag to come up to the surface. And then they're going to go over to us. And there we are. They're going to go over to us. And the swimmer is going to take the two railings uh, from the Zodiac to the submersible and attach those railings to the, submers to the sub. So there are the railings there. And things are swinging around because the camera is on his head, on his helmet. So pretty soon he's going to uh, dive um, and gives you a nice view of, of the submersible. And he's going to climb up on top. And by the way, I think this is one of the best jobs in the world, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> and the name of the swimmer, um, his name is Speedo. <laughs> That's his nickname. <laughs> he's from South Africa. Uh, he was uh, just a joy to, to work with. Now they're going to hand him uh, one railing, and he's going to attach that to, to one side of the sub and then the other railing to the other side. Uh, the railing is really, really important uh, for us because as we come out of the sub, we are again uh, suspended away from the ship. So we've got to be able to make our way out of the sub, go across the top of it, and then step onto the ship. And after about uh, 10 and a half hours, uh, I, my legs were really wobbly. So uh, you really need the, the railing so that you don't fall off uh, into, the, into the water. So he's putting those on and uh, now <laughs> everything's okay. So the Zodiac goes back to the ship and he's just going to uh, make sure that everything is okay on top of the submersible. And he'll just sit there and wait until the ship comes and then they uh, uh, bring it uh, on board. So the next part of his, his duties will be just to enjoy uh, waiting uh, until the ship comes. <laughs> and you can see it was a lovely day. Uh, we didn't have uh, any problems with uh, conditions. Uh, beautiful, beautiful water. And I just thought this was a really cool video, again, because of the, the vantage point of his, his GoPro uh, helmet uh, camera. Okay, so I'm almost finished. Just a little bit uh, more here. So as you can see, there's a bit of a little bit of separation between the sub and the ship. And I'm leaning against that railing. I really need it. And uh, they give us life jackets uh, so that we, just in case we do fall over, uh, we, we have the, the protection there. So with the dive completed, I was very lucky because not everyone gets cake at the end of their dive. <laughs> there was cake for us because this was Victor's 15th and for now final dive to Challenger Deep. Uh, given that he's sold this operation, uh, we're not quite sure what, what's next for him. And uh, the, the scientific objectives for uh, inkfish expeditions are not focused on diving as much. They, they want to do lander science which is really cool too. So at any, at any rate, we got a chocolate cake with the limiting factor on it and we got some alcohol, <laughs> which, was, which was nice, got some champagne. And of course there were Legos. I, I built Legos while I was at sea. And if, uh, if Mark Raleigh is in the audience, uh, I have my minifig, this is my minifig <laughs> that was designed <laughs> for me or of me. <laughs> There's also a Riley minifig. Uh, the, I want to talk about my, my roommate, uh, Kate Wawatai. She was the person who trained me in uh, the procedures to safely get into the submersible and out of the submersible and the safety procedures. Uh, she uh, actually trained me what to do in case Victor were to become incapacitated and how to bring the sub back up to the surface. She is also the only woman on uh, their submersible support crew and she is now uh, a certified submersible pilot herself. So she, and she's just a wonderful person. Uh, she is Maori from New Zealand, and she has this dream of piloting uh, this submersible to the Kermadec Trench. The Kermadec Trench uh, offshore of New Zealand is a sacred place for the Maori people. So for her to make that dive uh, will just be absolutely tremendous. 
and uh, she became a really good friend. And that's, of course, that's Victor peeking in. Uh, and I've got my Stanford cap on because he was so happy every time he saw me with the Stanford cap on. So you got to keep the main guy happy. <laughs> Another thing that was fun was our CBS news crew. They they flew a lot of drone footage uh, from the ship for for their programming, which was really neat. But we were rocking back and forth uh, a wet deck, you know, the conditions at sea. So they usually needed somebody to rather than try to land the drone uh, on the deck of the ship, they needed a drone catcher. So <laughs> after I finished my dive, there were two other dives that took place uh, afterwards and I, I was not involved in those. So I became uh, the drone catcher. <laughs> so that was, that was fun as well. And this is our, our happy crew coming into port into Palau. And we had, uh, because I, I should mention that the other two dives were to the, the Yap Trench and to the Palau Trench. And those were the first descents of human beings to those trenches. Uh, and for the Palau Trench, uh, Tommy Remengasau, uh, the man in the red and white cap, he is the former president of Palau, the Republic of Palau, and he, he did the dive. The man next to him is the current president uh, of Palau. Uh, I'm off to the right there and, and Victor is there. Former president and current president, no secret service uh, at all. Very, very relaxed, a, a beautiful, wonderful uh, country. Uh, we, we had a, a nice ceremony, uh, fantastic swimming and snorkeling and diving. And I just really loved the whole experience. So again, you can see the 3D uh, renditions of the dive at that address. And you can get to the story map at this address. And I just really appreciate having the opportunity to share this with you because I wouldn't have been able to do this without my life at Oregon State University. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don, for this inspiring, amazing talk. The visuals are just phenomenal. And I have the pleasure of maybe chatting with you a little bit. Yes, okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Tuba Oskan Haller, and I am the I have the pleasure and privilege to be the Dean of the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. And I will also have the pleasure to help us all have a conversation with Don for the next 17 or so minutes. Um, and I love that we have the lights on on the stage, but can we also turn the lights on for the audience so I can see some hands as mm. folks are uh, thinking about formulating some questions. Um, and I'll start us off while you all are thinking about what your questions might be. We have two folks, Doug over here and Tyler over here, who will be helping out with microphones so that the audience that's watching over Zoom can also hear your questions. Um, so if you have a question, you know, you can indicate that by raising your hand and we'll alternate back and forth between Tyler and Doug. For those of you who are online, I believe um, we have one faculty member who is um, looking at the questions online and we'll try to alternate back and forth if we have the time to do so. With that though, maybe I'll start with the first question okay. uh, while folks are thinking about theirs. So one thing that I really enjoyed about this talk is that you talked about the fact this wasn't just a record setting dive that you did, that you all did just for the purpose of diving to those depths. Mm -hmm. In fact, you had some science that you were thinking about and you gave some other examples of scientific experiments that people can do with these kinds of landers. Now, clearly, the images of all of those creatures that are down there are really useful. That mm -hmm. in itself is data that you're mm -hmm. bringing back just by diving down mm -hmm. there. But tell me about other kind of science projects that you might think about now that you've gone down there or that you know others are thinking about with these kinds of mm -hmm. vehicles. Tell us a little bit yeah. more about what the science is that we can engage in. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Tuba, because... One thing about a submersible is that it, it, it is, especially this submersible, because this submersible was designed to, to go down vertically and to, to make a descent, to set a record. Mm -hmm. uh, it also has a robotic arm for taking rock samples or, or animal samples, but it is not 
the type of scientific submersible that Alvin is, for mm -hmm. instance, or, or the Fendoja. Because if you look at the design submersibles, uh, they are designed to, to move horizontally uh, very, very efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't go up and down uh, as efficiently, uh, but that's not the point because they are designed to be sampling and mm -hmm. surveying uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, the limiting factor is not. Mm -hmm. uh, and what Victor was trying to do was to, to try to do some science, even though he had built this uh, submersible to set vertical records. Yeah. So uh, that's where the lander science is, is really the, the more substantive science that is done. And uh, there's so many species that are being discovered with these landers. They're, they're, they've taken the landers up to the Japan Trench uh, and they're, they're doing other parts of the Pacific right now. We're not quite sure where they are because their ink fish is not as, um, we, don't, we don't see as much on social media what they're doing, uh, but they are basically doing hadal biology mm -hmm. and they are uh, sampling these animals and they're doing genetic studies. One of the things that they're trying to do is a global genetic comparison uh, of these hadal species mm -hmm. in all of the trenches and see uh, to see what the uh, that the connection is uh, in terms of their uh, who who is a cousin of whom and also what we can learn about why and how do these creatures uh, exist at these depths. And what can we learn in terms of maybe uh, for the biopharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. or just understanding uh, how these, these creatures function. Now, for, for us with the, the side scan sonar instrument, uh, you also cannot really use a submersible as a surveying tool to, to get vast swaths of uh, the seafloor mapped. So we were not able to do that. We did a few mm -hmm. transects and we covered a postage stamp, just a few square hundred meters with that. Uh, but again, our purpose was to see if we could get that instrument just to turn on. Demonstration. And then that prototype will be further developed, uh, maybe into something that can be used by an AUV, an autonomous underwater vehicle uh, for, for surveying small parts of the seafloor that are, are a little larger, but the real, uh, large scale regional uh, surveying is done with, with ships or with larger uh, ROVs that can cover uh, bigger areas. Right, so if the lander had an arm, did you all have this thought of let's pick up this beer bottle and take it back Oh upstairs? gosh, we still wanted to. <laughs> yeah, but the, the weight considerations for the submersible because they everything has to be carefully planned and weighed, they even weigh you. Uh, so uh, to, to make sure that everything is, is copacetic, so to speak. And they told us you can either have the, the, the sonar or the arm. You can't have yeah. both. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it was only the, the sonar. So I when see. we saw that bottle, it was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the audience. Uh, we have a hand up all the way in the back, Tyler. But I see that. Um, yeah, let's start with all the way in the back, shall we? Tyler, you're going to get a bit of a workout there. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Don. Hi, Jamin. <laughs> um, so I was really interested in the sonar. The sonar you use. You said you use side scan, and I grew up fishing uh, bass fishing tournaments. So, yeah. so I'm familiar with side scan technology. I'm curious how it differed in application at the trench, and just anything about it in general. Uh, well, it's it's the same type of of instrument. Uh, it was a 75 kilohertz uh, sonar at, at that frequency, but it's the same principle of sending these acoustic pulses from the instrument uh, to the, to the seafloor or through the water column. And then you get reflections uh, from the pulse uh, if you're in the water column, such as for, for fish. In our case, we were looking for uh, reflections uh, from the instrument to the seafloor coming back and measuring only the strength of the return uh, as, as opposed to the, uh, the travel time. Mm -hmm. So it, it's basically the, the, same, the same principle. It's just the electronics uh, of these instruments uh, that still have to evolve. In fact, I, I think they used, um, if you've got poor spaces uh, in these instruments, that's going to lead to implosion. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they fill in the spaces in, the, in these instruments with gels. Uh, I, I'm really eager to learn more about how these instruments are, are really made. And I talked a little bit with some of the scientists at Woods Hole Oceanographic 
uh, when I visited there in May, they were really interested in the sonar as well, because uh, as, as so many of us know, similar to here at Oregon State, uh, we, we can build our own instruments. Oceanographers build their own instruments uh, and build them specifically for certain purposes. So there's a lot of nice sharing back and forth in, in terms of like, how is my glider design uh, compared to your glider design? Uh, can we work together so that we can both uh, have a, a, an outcome so that everybody can can do their science at certain depths or in certain conditions? Yeah, thank you. Maybe we'll go to the side over here. Go for it. Uh, thank you. I was wondering from your experience, how important were the windows as opposed to using high resolution cameras on the outside and having a sealed uh, uh, device. We needed everything. Uh, we we needed the the windows. There's something, there's something about human perception. I don't know what it is, but if you can see things out the window, at least for me, I understand uh, the the spatial relationship of things. Uh, I can uh, I can recognize things better. Uh, and in our case, we really really needed uh, to have those viewports. There were cameras on either end of the submersible. And there were also cameras on the, the front part of the submersible. And we could see through those cameras, but the, the quality of those images was not, it was not the same thing as looking out, out the window. So this is oftentimes the, uh, the justification for human occupied vehicles, as opposed to just going completely autonomous. Now we're gonna have to have as many autonomous vehicles as possible uh, in order to to see and to to get to most of the ocean, but there are special places uh, where it I think it's still very appropriate to send human beings. Mm -hmm. And there's also the idea that some of these uh, some of these vehicles, if we can get to the point where we can take non scientists down, there's the teacher at sea program, for instance, where where K through 12 teachers are going to sea, and it's just it, it, it blows their mind, it, it, it uh, revolutionizes the way that they teach, it energizes them. Uh, and I believe Rev Ocean uh, in, in Norway, it's an, a Norwegian uh, organization, uh, they have uh, a submersible that they are using uh, for, certainly for scientists, but to take uh, other people down as well. Uh, has anybody read uh, Susan Casey's latest book, which is, uh, uh, the oh my gosh the day is getting to me the the unknown who who's read Susan Casey's latest book <laughs> Susan Casey did a fantastic book about uh, waves in the ocean and she's just written the book uh, about the the underworld oh. uh, and she did uh, as she is an, a journalist and an author and she did a, a, a submersible dive and just absolutely her ability to describe our science, I think does us uh, a lot, it does great good for us because that book uh, is really starting to uh, make an impact. And we can do all the science communication, we are doing it, but sometimes you need a little help. So to have a, a very Story skilled talent. author like that. Yeah. So our eyes and our bodies are great data gathering machines. Yeah, that I, are I not think so, our perception. Replaced. Is there a question from, over, from online? Yes, there are a couple questions from online. Uh, one relates to the notion of an underworld. The first question is, did it scare you to do this dive? And the second question, I'll give you two because I know you can cope with it, is <laughs> uh, what types and how many instruments have been developed to operate at Adel depths? Yeah. Oh. And and Don, maybe I'll follow up on the question about whether or not it, it scared you, because I was also going to ask you what were the emotions and not just fear, mm -hmm. but what other emotions were there? I, I, I had no no fear. I, I had a lot of excitement. It, 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 it was mainly because of the experience diving before in, in Alvin. Uh, and also I've been in the Pisces. I did, the, the difference with those uh, dives is that they just weren't as deep. Uh, so uh, I'm going to address something before it, it gets brought up, which is it, which is what do you do about uh, going to the to the bathroom? Um, <laughs> let's just get it out <laughs> uh, because those shallower dives, there was no problem with that. Uh, but the, that if there's any fear, that was the fear that I had. Could I hold it for ten and a half hours? Uh, and and I'm I'm serious. Uh, 
uh, my friend Kate uh, trained me how to slowly dehydrate over the course of two days before my dive so that uh, I didn't, uh, I, I wasn't putting myself in danger, but I, I, I was able to hold it for, for 10 and a half hours. And so was, so was Victor. Uh, the, the instruments, the entire submersible, the engineering that goes into uh, everything that's associated with the submersible uh, that is designed to uh, withstand these depths. So it's the, the cameras, uh, the lights, uh, everything, uh, all of that has to be engineered so that it will not implode uh, at these great depths. Yeah. So everything that is used, uh, it's just remarkable. It's kind of amazing how we do all of this engineering so that all those things don't get crushed by the mm -hmm. pressure and the beer bottle just survives. Yeah, it's a, well, <laughs> not designed for this purpose. I know, glass. Yeah. This glass. is the uh, this is the wonder of silica. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah, how about a question from Mike over here, Doug? The uh, the snailfish. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, there aren't many photons of light that make it down. So oh my goodness, that's a great question. Whatever. Yes. So how do they how do they navigate? What what is their? I have no idea. I really I really don't. Uh, and this is what the uh, the halo biology community is trying to figure out. You know how these? Why does a creature like that have eyes? Mm -hmm. uh, because we descended into total darkness uh, around that 918 meter that we were in uh, entering. Uh, coming through the twilight zone at that depth. And then below that depth is complete darkness. There is this uh, amazing biosphere that lives in complete darkness in the ocean, I think. Uh, and the biologists uh, in the in the audience can can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our the, the greatest biosphere on our planet is in that twilight zone uh, where where we have lost uh, light in the ocean. So certainly at 10, uh, that was at 918 meters. So at 10,919 mm -hmm. meters, of course, everything was completely dark. And yet uh, they seemed not disturbed they, by the They lights. were not disturbed. They, uh, they seemed to be attracted to the, to the lander. But I, I don't know why these creatures have eyes. Uh, they, they don't need them. Uh, the, they, they weren't using bioluminescence either. So uh, it's it's a wonderful mystery that continues to be solved by uh, the biologists in that community. Yeah, thank you. More questions? Oh, maybe oh, over there. Yeah, let's go there and then we'll come to you, Pedro. Uh, kind of adjacent to that question, I was curious if you visually saw any any other biological life forms that we didn't see on the video and what those yes. were. Yes, so, so I'll mention... Uh, I, I know a lot of us are concerned about plastic and plastic waste in the ocean. And we did see uh, several little uh, amphipods uh, outside of our uh, viewport. And we were pretty sure those were Eurythenes plasticus. So Eurythenes plasticus is a little uh, species of amphipod that is named thusly because when it was discovered a few years ago, just discovered a few years ago, and they dissected the creatures, they found uh, human made plastic, microplastic in its tissues. So it's, it's a tragic circumstance that a newly discovered species has to be named Plasticus because of the amount of pla microplastic mm -hmm. that's in its tissues, already entrained in its tissues. Now these creatures, the ones that we saw were swimming happily, they were coping, they, they, uh, they exist, they live, but they, it's like, I think I was describing it to someone like, if you if you have uh, emphysema or if you have a black lung, I mean you're you're living, you're coping, mm. but you 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 have this uh, handicap, and that's mm. what they that's what they live with. Yeah. So let's go to a question over here, and while we're doing that, maybe we can have Pedro get the um, phone on this side. Savannah over here. Hi. I was Hi. curious what your emergency procedures were. I know you oh, said you mm -hmm. were trained if the captain, yeah. if Victor didn't make it, but what else did you guys have? <laughs> now, now, luckily the, um, the submersible is a, a very complex vehicle, but the safety procedures are very simple. So uh, I was shown where, the, where Victor's radio was on, on his side, on the port side. And uh, it's just a regular, like a CB radio and uh, I was instructed to radio x-ray, x-ray, x-ray uh, to the surface. 
uh, it takes about seven seconds for, for that uh, transmission to reach the surface uh, because of the, the depth. And then there were a couple of switches, just a couple of switches to uh, release the weights of the submersible and to start the submersible on its upward ascent. So, so that, that was it. So if Victor had had a heart attack or whatever, had been incapacitated in any, mm -hmm. in any way, uh, that, that's basically all it took to come back to the surface. Now that is assuming that we, are, uh, we have clear, a clear ascent. Uh, there was one time where I was uh, I was not on the dive, but uh, the, the, this was an Alvin incident where where Alvin had gotten stuck with a, in a little crevice, and there was an overhang, mm. uh, and so and we were listening to the uh, submersible pilot uh, as she, in fact, uh, it was Cindy Lee Vandover, who to this day is the only woman uh, pilot of Alvin. Uh, she was transmitting to the surface what she was trying to do to move the submersible back and forth to get it out of that crevice, because that was ultimately uh, what they needed to do to save their lives. Alvin, at least the 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 Alvin that I was in, because Alvin has changed and evolved, and it's a it's a better vehicle now. But with Alvin, uh, the personnel sphere will detach, will release uh, from the the body of the submersible and take you to the surface. Now you might have some broken uh, limbs from from that ascent, mm. but the limiting factor is not like that. Uh, you 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 come up intact, uh, but you but you've got to have uh, you can't be entangled. So that that is another thing that we did see down there was we saw scientific cabling. Mm. Uh, there there is scientific uh, pollution uh, mm. in, in these survey areas, and Victor believed that the uh, the cabling was from the Fendoja Chinese submersible when they were, they, they made one uh, descent into the Western pool. And there's one area that he had seen before that there's tons of cabling. Mm. This is again why the Ocean Gate uh, Titan uh, misadventure was so sure. dangerous because to get so close to the Titanic wreck uh, with, with all, everything that's sticking out from that wreck, it's, it, it's an entanglement hazard and that is certain death for uh for a submersible for a submersible diver so he didn't we didn't go uh near that area where where the, there was a lot of cabling but we saw one cable uh, beneath us after the beer bottle <laughs> yeah yeah and then we were fine but but that that's the main thing you you have a, a clear path up to the surface and then you're you you just it, it will take three hours to get there and you have to make sure that you do that with enough oxygen uh that's uh within the vehicle Gosh, time flies. It looks like we're really oh, actually out of time, girls. but I had promised one more question. So we'll take one more question and then um, we'll see if we can close it out. I can shed a little light on the snailfish questions. <clears throat> the snailfishes um, generally have a very well-developed hydrodynamic system on the head of pores and connecting canals. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they also have uh, sensory cells over their entire body, which respond to mm. any water currents, things like that. Um, and the eyes are functional. They can probably see bioluminescence as, as flashes of light, mm. although they probably don't have very good visual acuity. Yeah. Wow. Excellent. Thank you so much for Thank that. You. And, and you know, snailfish, aren't they? They're snailfish in estuaries. Correct? Excuse so me? They are snailfish species in estuaries. There's something about the, the snailfish. It's, the snailfish, yes, there is something about the snailfish. But <laughs> snailfishes are probably the most broadly distributed mm -hmm. uh, geographically and bathymetrically yeah. uh, family of marine fishes. They mm -hmm. occur from estuaries and the intertidal all the way down to about 80, 100 meters. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, Thank you for that Thank input. You. And so I will close with one question that I will ask Don, and I'll give you a little bit of time to think about it. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll tell this audience about some plans um, for, the, for the future. I, I want you to think about one word that you would use to describe this entire adventure. Just one. And while you're thinking about that, um, Don spoke a lot about Vic Victor Vescovo. Um, we're hoping uh, to get v Victor Vescovo onto our campus at some point to tell us a little bit more about what 
what drove him, what kinds of other adventures he can talk about. So keep that in mind and um, uh, watch out for an announcement, hopefully, of that happening, perhaps. Just saying. Mm -hmm. um, with that, though, what one word would you would you use, Don? Amazing. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I was just constantly amazed the whole time. Li yeah. Dive of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don, we are so thankful that you came to visit with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.